Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the memorable Springbok career of 1995 Rugby World Cup champion Johan Ru. Johan, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for inviting me. Now, before we begin our conversation, let's take a look at this week's trivia question. Who were South Africa's first opponents in the June tests in 2006? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Johan knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of the conversation. Johan, I would like to begin in 1994. The Springboks were given quite a hiding by England at Loftus in the first test match. You were then called up to uh, take the number nine jersey in the second test match. What was the atmosphere like in the Bok camp? <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Um, uh, Ian Mack and... Uh, before the first test, he, he had a thing on the board where he, where he was, he, he kept saying you you would want to do something. Um, you want to go to a ruck, you want to <laughs> do everything. And then on the second test, um, it suddenly be, became you have to. <laughs> you have to go to the ruck, you have to do this and that, you have to make a tackle. Um, yeah, it was embarrassing because it was a terrible England side. Um, they've lost to provincial sides. And I think, um, you know, when I was roommates with um, Joel Stransky, and when we walked into the team room before the first test, you know, the guys were joking, joking around. And we actually looked at each other and said, there might be trouble here. Um, we completely... Um, uh, it didn't take them at par value, and um, they just exposed us. So the second test was a hugely different story. The week, the build-up, the uh, the tenseness, um, the atmosphere, and I think it's you know that's why we we managed to beat them, even though the weather was in their favour. And for you personally, what did it feel like making your test day before the box? Yeah, it was weird. You know, you. It's 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 obviously a big moment, um, but because I've been involved, I was involved with the box, um, sitting on the bench, and you know, on the previous tests, I think it wasn't such a big, <laughs> huge moment. Um, it was more about the game and winning the game. Um, that was important, and um, you know, after that was also the New Zealand tour coming up, so um, it was important to make to make sure that you play well enough to be picked to go on to, onto the tour. Speaking of that tour to New Zealand, I've had quite a few Springboks on this show that have told me that that was the toughest tour that they had ever been on. Would you go along with that? Yeah, it was a difficult tour. I mean, what happened actually happened was the the first test against England, there was a imitational team that played a Nor Northern Transvaal team. Um, and Kits Christie coach the imitational side and John Williams the Northern Transvaal side. And they smacked the um, imitational team, which, which was made up of a lot of the guys that should have been picked um, for the Springbok Tour. Um, and Northern Transvaal just ran all over them. And suddenly, you know, a lot of those Northern Transvaal guys were picked for the Tour <laughs> in the, for the New Zealand tour, and it, I mean, we don't say talk about whether guys um, should have been Springboks or not, but you know, I think there were better guys the, um, that could have been picked for the tour, and um, also the you know the um, the forwards of Natal, of course, of course, Mac was coach. Um, the, the Fords didn't really, I mean, like Guy Kebble and that, um, they didn't want to do a scrum before the test. We didn't do one scrum. Um, and then when it got to the, uh, Saturday, you know, when I put the ball in, I almost had to start sprinting to get the ball at the back. That's how much we were pushed. Um, so there were, there were a lot of factors that, that influenced that, uh, that, that squad and that tour before it even started. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was tough. It was very tough to uh, um, when you lose. It's not not good, um, and especially when your mid your midweek the dirt tracker start losing, then it becomes problematic. 
No doubt. So, Johan, I actually had Ian McIntosh on this show uh, shortly before he passed. Uh, I believe that it was the last interview that he gave, so I'm very privileged to have been able to have him on the show. Um, one thing he mentioned about that 1994 series against the All Blacks was that each team scored three tries in the series, and he believed that that meant it was quite close and we actually could have won the series. Would you go along with that? Yeah, we should have beaten them easy, uh, to be honest. Uh, Fr the French just beat them um, when we arrived there. Um, and we we really, um, second test was in our hands. Um, the third test, uh, you know, Yapi went straight through, should have just passed. Uh, we drew that test. Um, looking back on that, uh, I, I, I would say this, the first test we should have lost. But test two and three should have been two one for us for sure. Speaking of that second test, you'll remember it's now known for the biting incident uh, from Johan Leroux. What was your reaction to that? Look, the worst thing of that is people thought it. Even now, still think it was me because Johan Leroux and Johan Leroux. So, <laughs> um, but you know what? That, that's uh, Johan Leroux is a funny guy and. Um, you know, the, I know Fitzpatrick was it antagonizing him and irritating him the whole test. Um, I think it was just a bit of frustration, but um, you know, they turned it into such a huge thing. It was, it was stupid. I mean, it's just a bite. <laughs> And many would say that it was justified as well. Uh, let's move on then. <laughs> oh, and, and you know, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, at that stage, punching and kicking was still allowed. So, I mean, a bite is nothing compared to <laughs> the punching and kicking that was going on. Quite right. There was a lot of that going on in those days. Uh, Johan, we spoke about Ian McIntosh. After that uh, tour to New Zealand, he was out of the picture. How did you experience him as a coach? He was a wonderful guy, a wonderful coach. Um, I think I think the only problem was that he listened too much to to the Natal players. Um, there was guys that had big influence. The guy Kebble, um, John Allen, um, and they they kind of ruled. But as a as a technical coach, um, he was he was fantastic. His, his passion for the game was fantastic. Um, so from from that point of view, he's a fantastic guy. It's a pity when I heard he he, he passed away, and um, but I think you know his his legacy will live on forever. And how about your assessment of Kitch Christie? Yeah, you know we we grew up with Kitch, so he was he was also our coach at Lions Transvaal at that stage. Um, so you know we loved him. He was he was such an incredible guy that um, we never wanted to disappoint him. Um, if you had a bad game, you, you you couldn't get less what anyone else said. You just felt you you disappointed Ketch. Um, and then when he became sick and, and things like that, it was incredible. You know, we after we beat Natal in the Lion, Lions Cup, uh, the next day we were at the hospital with him and all we could talk about was rugby. Um, you know, as sick as he was. So um, no, he was a, he was an incredible guy. Out of out of the two, very different people. Um, uh, I think uh, Mac was more passionate. Uh, where Kitch was a lot more analytical. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if he, the people told you, but in ninety ninety five um, World Cup, uh, he actually phoned some news guys at Disney World because they got the biggest or most sophisticated weather system in the world to, to plan for the weather. So, <laughs> you know, he was that kind of guy. Attention to deal, detail was incredible too. I have heard that Disney story and I seem to think it was Kurbis Witzel or Bali Swart who told the story uh, in a TV interview that I must have seen quite a few years ago now. Um, Johan, let's move on to the 1995 Rugby World Cup and the pre-tournament training sessions. Joel Stransky told me that it was torture. What do you say? Um, <laughs> yeah, look, kids believe in fitness. Um, so we did fitness. I mean, we did fitness the last week before the the World Cup final. And till the day Kitch died, he still believed that 
that fitness session we did um, on the Monday before the World Cup final helped us in the in the overtime. Um, but it was, you know, everyone was fighting for a spot um, uh, to be, because Kitts made it clear there's going to be a, a gold team and a green team. And everyone knew beforehand where they were going to be. So um, everyone was fighting for a spot there. Um, so you can imagine if you put highly big, big guys, highly um, that, uh, that's fit as hell, and each one wants a spot, it's, it's, it's going to be ugly. And it was ugly. But um, it also helped us, um, I think, to prepare for the World Cup. Um, because that made us really competitive in everything that we did. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time. And with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now. And I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. Your first match of the tournament was against Romania. I think it's fair to say it's a match that the Springboks were expected to win by a large margin, but it turned out to be quite a tough affair. What was it about them that was so difficult to combat? No, you know what happened? Um, the day, their last training session were at Hamilton's or uh, something like that. And apparently, um, Hamilton's had a game the night before, and they didn't clean the the change rooms, and they didn't. Uh, it, it was filthy, and so it motivated these guys so much that <laughs> that when they arrived on the field that next day, you know, they were kamikazes. I mean, they tackled us to absolute crap, <laughs> and. Um, uh, that that was the beginning, and we we also played them a little bit wrong. Um, we tried to tap everything that Kitch wanted, that but um, we should have just taken the points up front. Um, but you know, it's, it's it's a difficult game because if you beat them hundred nil, everyone says, "Oh, it's expected." And suddenly you beat them thirty whatever. I can't even remember what the what the score was, and people say, "Oh, it was a tough game." what happened so it's and it's it's one of those no win situations similar to canada if you win by a large margin people would say it was only canada and uh, as you say was the case with romania but i must ask you about the canadian match did you get any shots in during that fight <laughs> no no i didn't um you know it was a crazy canada came out um to to intimidate and um, and try and cause that from the start. Uh, it's the only way they could win. Um, so, unfortunately, that that happened. And, you know, James got um, banned from the tournament. And if you really look at the at, at, at the video, there's no way he should have, should have done that. Um, I know in the hearings, the, the lawyers were saying, look at how aggressive you're running towards the guy. I mean, it's absolute rubbish. Um, but yeah, that you know that that also opened up for Chester to come in. Um, so you know, you have to take the good with the bad. Indeed. And speaking of bad, I think that would be a very underwhelming way to describe the weather that you guys encountered in the semi-final against France in Durban. I know that you started the match on the bench and then came on later, but during the match. Were you sitting there looking at the conditions and thinking, I'll be quite happy not to get onto the field here today? Yeah, I know. I mean, and, you know, US never got injured. So um, I never expected, to, I wasn't worried because US never gets injured. And suddenly, you know, uh, Rudy Jabez said to me, warm up. I said, for what? And he said, because US shoulders is sore. Um, he's coming off. Um, but I don't know if, if people told you, but the the guy that actually saved the, um, us from going to the final was really late because they wanted to not play the match. And if we didn't play the match, then uh, we would have been out. 
And I was listening to him telling the uh, the guys what would happen to them if they don't play. Um, and he made it abundantly clear that this game will take place even if the guys have to swim. Um, so he was he was the guy that saved the World Cup for, for South Africa. And I think we're all very grateful for that. Johan, when it came to the Rugby World Cup final itself, uh, maybe it was just a stroke of luck, but the TV cameras managed to catch you and Narka Drotsky on the bench celebrating and cheering the guys on. And it became quite a famous moment as well. Just describe what it was like sitting there watching that Rugby World Cup final. You know, it's terrible to watch a game. You'd rather be on the field than sitting to watching because you're not when you're not involved it's, it's you're more nervous um than playing when you when you're playing at least you can one once you have a couple of tackles and the physicalness the the, the tension kind of disappears um but geez today uh, I, I think we were all at the edge um i don't think i think they put the cameras on us but if you put it on half the people there they, they would look the same <laughs> And I think half the people in South Africa at their homes, it would have looked the same. Um, you know, we were just spectators uh, wanting a side to win, really. That's what we were. And what did it feel like when the referee blew the final whistle? No, of course, then it was jubilation. Um, um, something you work so hard for and that, that we work so hard for and planned. And, and that when when a plan comes together, it's always, always wonderful. And... Um, yeah, uh, it was uh, it was just a great feeling. It was a wonderful moment for the country. Uh, I mean, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was just a, a young boy at the time, but as I say, uh, special, special memories. So, Johan, at the same time, rugby was on the verge of turning professional. What can you tell us about the conversations that Francois Pinot was having with you guys regarding uh, contracts? <laughs> um, you know what? Uh, there was, there was. I think we went to um, Sun City after the, after we did the tour through South Africa, uh, through Joburg on the bus, on the bus, um, and um, there was conversations that that came out that they wanted us to, uh, to have a professional that things are turning professional and the, uh, Francia was representing a side. Um, I don't want to go into too much details, um, but yeah, it was it was interesting times because as the World Cup winners, um, all the sides wanted to have the World Cup winners to sign with them. Uh, so you had Becker on the one side and Murdoch on the other side. Um, and if it wasn't for us winning the World Cup, I don't know where it would have gone because the All Blacks and and uh, Australia, especially, wanted to go with Becker. And it would have been a huge disruption in world rugby if that happened. And I guess we'll never know. But I think it's fair to say that it worked out okay in the end. Let's move on to 1996 and the Tri-Nations. Uh, you featured in that away from home, uh, first up against the Wallabies and the All Blacks. As we, I mean, we wouldn't have known at the time, but as we now know 20, 30 years later, every single year it seems as if the box go to Australia and New Zealand, and I think we probably lose 80, even 90% of the time. And then funny enough, especially the Wallabies, they'll come to South Africa and then we beat them almost 90% of the time. Johan, why is it so difficult for the box to go over there? Yeah, I, I think it's just the... Uh... Number one is the, the the traveling there and the it's 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 weird. You lie in the bed the whole week and at, at three o'clock in the morning you hear the TVs on <laughs> in the guys' rooms because your body clock, is, especially when you when you travel from west to east, is 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 terrible. Um, it's much easier traveling east to west. Um, and uh, that, that's got a huge impact on it. Um, look, New Zealand is always New Zealand. Uh, the sides there, when you play New Zealand, you can beat them by 70 points. And in the last 10 minutes, uh, you'll still get the hardest tackles <laughs> of, of the game. Uh, they just play for 80 minutes. So their teams are quality, uh, very difficult to, to win there. 
Um, but uh, Australia, you know, Australia used to be much better sides because it was only, remember, it was only um, Queensland um, and New South Wales, really. Um, that caused the cohesiveness in Australia to be much better than it is now. So Australia was a proper rugby side. Um, and now they've got huge problems, but when we played them, they were always a very intelligent side to play against. Um, so you're playing against intelligent guys with that's highly athletic, uh, whereas when you play the All Blacks, they're very physical and maybe don't play as intelligent rugby, um, but their physicalness makes up for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it took us a long time to uh, really adapt to um, the speed and the physicalness of of the, that rugby coming out of just playing here with between ourselves for so long. And then your last test match for the Springboks was just a few weeks later against the All Blacks in Durban. How disappointed were you that it would end there? Um, you know what? It's weird. I wasn't. It, it was fun. I, you know, rugby was always kind of a second, <laughs> uh, a second thing for me. I mean, I always loved golf so so much. Um, I know Kitch. Uh, when we travelled to New Zealand and Australia, he said to me that um, I'm not allowed to bring my golf clubs with uh, to the airport, which. I found astounding, but they they all knew. I think everyone knew that, you know, golf was my number one love and rugby was my second. So, you know, it, uh, it wasn't, I, I was ready to stop. And, you know, when I was ready, said, I enjoyed the time there. But there's always going to be new guys. Quite right. Uh, now, earlier I spoke to you about Kitch Christie and Ian McIntosh. Obviously, in 1996, Andre Markroff had become the new Springbok coach. Tell us a little bit about him as a coach. He's the, uh, you know, Andre again, very different. Um, obviously, Afrikaans guy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the Afrikaans mentality was, uh, was there. Um, he loved his forwards. Um, so we didn't really have a lot of interaction, um, but um, you know he was a. I think the the good thing about Andre was he he had good people, surrounded himself with good people, and he listened to people also. Um, but he was a good motivator, um, and uh, yeah, I, look out of out of the three. I, I spent the least amount of time with him. Um, I, I think I only played under him with a, yesterday. Yeah, very, very few games under him. So it was diffi it's difficult for me to speak about him. But, you know, we, I enjoyed my time under him. He, he had certain vision for the side. And, you know, I knew it was kind of my end. So I was, I was gone. I just want to come back to that story about the contract, Sir Johan, because I've also heard from some of the guys that obviously the 1995 winners, they had a certain contract and then the new players in the team, they had a different contract and that caused a little bit of tension in the camp. Now, I can understand that if you didn't have a World Cup contract, that maybe there would be more unhappiness from those guys and that you were obviously one of the guys that did have a World Cup contract, but so maybe you didn't quite experience it as much. But I'm just interested to hear from you if you experienced anything like that. Look, it, it must have been very difficult for for the guys who didn't have the the World Cup contracts, as we called it, um, to play provincial rugby next to us. Because, you know, you, you're playing the same game, you're playing the same team, we're getting paid. Yeah, they're getting paid. Yeah, um, it definitely caused a lot of problems, and that's that's actually why Australia and New Zealand wanted to go with Becker because there everyone would have got paid. Um, we were kind of selfish signing with with uh, Murdoch because only we got paid. Um, so looking back at it. <laughs> You know, it it must have been really difficult for the guys, and yeah, that it, it, it definitely caused 
conflict. It also caused um, uh, problems between us and late. Um, you know, it didn't it didn't affect the the other provincial guys uh, because they they weren't close to late, but. He never liked that we got him into a corner and almost made him sign the made him sign the contract with us. Um, and he held it against us for a very long time. So we were right there in the lines then, and uh, we felt the brunt of that that hate um, every week. Johan, I've actually read a brilliant uh, biography of Louis Late. Uh, it was written by Max Dupree uh, a few years ago now, actually. But uh, it's something that was quite interesting while I was reading it. It did come across as if some players had a good relationship with him and others didn't. And maybe there were others still who didn't have any relationship at all. Maybe it was just a hello and a goodbye whenever you saw him. I'd like to hear from you uh, what your relationship was like with Louis Late. Yeah, I had a good relationship with him. Um... I, I liked him because it, it was, you know, he really loved rugby. Um, really loved rugby. Always wanted the best for rugby. He was, he was <laughs> almost like Trump who says, you know, uh, make a better, uh, you know, USA. Um, and everyone hates him. You have guys that hate him and guys who loved him. So I, I would, I think it's, good. it's almost putting him as the Trump of South Africa. Um, but the one thing, he, he really loved rugby. Um, and he tried to do whatever it, it takes. Uh, in saying that, he likes to be in control. Um, and he didn't like anyone to oppose him. So if you had different viewpoints and he didn't like you, you know, you were... <laughs> put to the side um but um yeah i i liked him he's a he was a very intelligent guy um you had to when you go up against him which we tried to do on a couple of times you we, we had to have our things in really in order because we we actually went on strike um at, at the lions that's before the world cup contracts were signed and all we wanted was, at that stage, we were paid with the envelope after every game. We wanted a, a salary, fixed salary, so we can finance cars and things like that. We wanted medical, and um, we wanted our wives to be able to sit in a box. I mean, that's what we went on strike for. <laughs> and eventually... I mean, a couple of, couple of weeks later, we signed the World Cup contracts, which, which turned everything upside down. Um, but but during that strike, it was an interesting time how we, how we tried to divide and conquer the side. Um, and it was incredible how we all stuck together. And that kept us together even afterwards when he, when he came for us. Um, we knew we could handle it. It's interesting how today those uh, demands seem like the simplest of things. Johan, let me ask you, who was your toughest opponent? Oh, you know what? It's difficult to say because um, they, they they, there's always good scrum offs, you know, that you play against. Um, even even from from local, um, uh, Kevin Butt in, in, in the towel with brilliant scrum off. Um, Joost obviously was always there. Um, so they were just yeah, there was good scrum offs. Then you go overseas, you play against Greg and um, uh, Dewey Morris. <laughs> um, played against um, uh, uh, Bishop, the New Zealander, who had the best hands of any scrum off ever. So it's it's so difficult to to say to say one um, because uh, scrum off is one of those positions. Where internationally, there's always good scrum offs. Uh, wherever you go, <laughs> it's kind of a position that uh, it's a critical position. So, one of your best players should always be a scrum off. Some wonderful players that you've mentioned there, indeed, uh, Johan. Is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? There's, there's, there's lots, but not that I can speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> 
there's a, there's incredible moments, but um, yeah, definitely not not what we can talk about on this program. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, as the saying goes, what goes on tour stays on tour. Uh, Johan, is there a particular player at the moment who you admire? You know, again, it's, 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 it's to pick one player is really difficult. Um, I think that in, in, in the South African side, we've, we've built such an incredible, incredible side. Um, you know, I, I love, Malcolm Marks, geez, I'm so such a pity that he's injured. Um, loved him. I, I love Achis Neyman. Um, it's a bit, um, you know, Kwaha when he comes on. Um, then you go to the back. I mean, Colby. Um, there's there's so many players. That's that's incredible. And and you know, internationally now, it it you almost don't have a bad player anymore. Um, in the top teams, they'll expose a bad player so quickly, it's unbelievable. Um, the speed of the game, I was telling my sons the other day, you know, the, the game's so quick now, I, I don't know whether I would have made it to all the rucks. You know, you have to be so quick and so fast now. Um, so, yeah, the, um, one player, I mean, obviously, the Pont is everyone's raves about the, the Pont. He's a, he's a brilliant scrum off. Um, so much diversity, and that, that's what makes them so difficult to play. You know, they do things that, that no other team does and that you won't expect from players. And what are you up to these days? Um, I'm into investment banking. Um, I've, I've, I was a stockbroker. And, um, stockbroker, investment banker, all my life. So um, we've got a small investment bank in Italy, um, and uh, we just we actually busy raising on to invest in sports and sport related businesses. So I've got to ask you then on that topic, Johan. I'm a big fan of investing in an S and P 500 ETF. That's kind of my philosophy at my level. Am I on the right track? Yeah, I mean. Listen, it's it's incredible. The Americans, you know, they it's it's almost like the New Zealanders. They think they can never lose. So when you when you invest in America, the market come down a little bit, but they so conditioned that the market will just go up and up and up. That the mentality is that the market just goes up and up and up. Um, I'm I'm just happy not into crypto because that's I believe that's the biggest load of crap in the world. <laughs> Look, I stay far away from stuff that I don't understand, so <laughs> that's what I do there. <laughs> Johan, let's uh, finish up by looking at the trivia question. Who were South Africa's first opponents in the June tests in 2006? Do you know the answer, Johan? 2006? I have no idea. <laughs> All right, we started off uh, with a two-test series against Scotland. I wouldn't have had a clue. <laughs> My, the, my, my trivia on rugby is terrible. <laughs> the only thing of significance really from those two test matches was that Scott Berger uh, broke his neck in that series. I and mean, then we were obviously without him for the rest of the season. Uh, Johan, let me say that it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure. And I hope that we can have you on again in the future. Anytime, Peter. Thanks for the invite, man. Last time on Front Row Rugby, I had another 1995 Rugby World Cup champion, Chris Rousseau, on the show. You can go and watch that. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, I'll have Hugh Reese edwards here.